Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual event with Neil Asbury and Jean-Pierre Isbouts to discuss Mapping America. Neil Asbury, a global entrepreneur and chief executive of the Legacy Companies, is host of the nationally syndicated radio talk show, Neil Asbury's Made in America by Radio America in Washington, DC. He's also a frequent guest on CNBC, Fox News, MSNBC, and the BBC. Professor Jean-Pierre Isbout is a best-selling National Geographic historian whose books have sold over two million copies, including The Biblical World, In the Footsteps of Jesus, The Story of Christianity, and Secret Societies. His lectures are featured on the great courses. Isbout is also the host and director of the Search for TV series currently airing on PBS stations and networks around the world. So a little bit about tonight's broadcast. The screen is full of the presentation that you're going to be seeing tonight. Um, and since throughout tonight's broadcast, you're also invited to ask questions. And you can do that by using the Ask a Question feature right at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can also order copies of Mapping America, of course, by pressing the big green button below. And that button also takes you to our shop site where you can find any of Jean-Pierre's other books as well if you'd like to order them. Um, we appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jean-Pierre and you. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here at this uh, special Books on Books event. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Neil and I are delighted that you're taking uh, some time out of your busy schedule to talk about our book that we're very excited about. And the first thing that you're probably wondering is, uh, what's this book about and why do we need another book about the origins of America? I mean, haven't we gotten that already down? I mean, there are hundreds of books on that subject. The birth of America, Columbus, we've heard that story before now, have you? The answer is yes and no, not really. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, my, my peers in history tend to ignore maps and yet, it, maps were the first mass medium in the time when the world was being explored for the first time, when America was being explored, and ultimately through the uh, American Revolution, maps played a crucial role in visualizing the things that people were discovering, uh, were conquering, were settling, and it was really the only way in which people could communicate to one another what these incredible lands on the horizon look like. So Neil and I felt that uh, this, this is a story that needed to be told afresh, this time through the lens of maps. And Neil can tell you a little bit more about the map that we're seeing here, which is the famous map by the Roman geographer Ptolemy. Neil? Yeah, the, the Claudius Ptolemy, uh, uh, Ptolemy was a, uh, a citizen of Rome. He lived in Alexandria, and um, he lived in the second century, and, and he created a grid and a set of coordinates. Um, he was a mathematician, and he, and, he, and, he, and he set up this grid and coordinates to where he could identify the land masses through all the, the known world during uh, the, the Roman time. Uh, this map that you see uh, was actually uh, engraved and printed in 1482. So it's a really incredible thing from the second century until the end of the uh, uh, 15th century, the, the, the knowledge that was known at that time came from, from the antiquity, almost the time of Jesus. And you see this map in the late 1400s, uh, Ptolemy's work became very popular because this is really where cartography started. The father of cartography is Ptolemy, and his work was the best work available uh, at the end of the Middle Ages, at the beginning of the Renaissance, a very, very important work that you see right here. That was the, this is a world is flat map. This is what was known before the time of Columbus, before the discovery of the Americas. So let's go on to the next stage because uh, what our book says is that essentially the birth of America was the result of the Renaissance. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the Renaissance. This was this incredible time 
It started in Florence in Italy in the, the early 15th century. Up to this point, it was the church and church doctrine that basically governed what people could do or could not do, could even think or not think. Uh, the church had a very strong control of philosophy and science and theology. And in 1502, largely because of tensions between the state of Florence, Tuscany, and the Vatican city-states where the Pope ruled, uh, scientists, scholars, artists, musicians broke through that stricture and decided to begin to discover the world on their own terms and formulated new ideals about human beings, about human rights, the idea that that humans should explore the world as it is empirically rather than guided by a particular theology. Now, that didn't mean that they were in any way less religious. The, the people of the Renaissance were still very pious, very observant Christians, but they did believe that God wants us to explore the world and to, to explore the richness and the drama and the incredible beauty of, of creation. And that's basically what led us to uh, the, the, the Renaissance. And, and um, Neil is going to tell you a little bit about an incredible publication that was one of the first books to be published using this new technology called the printing press. Neil? Well, um, Jean Perry, I actually have a copy of probably the most important work ever, ever produced. Um, this is the Nuremberg Chronicle. And the image that you see there comes from the Chronicle. It's inside the book. Also, that map that we've seen from Ptolemy, uh, that world is flat map, is also in this book. Very, very important work, the Nuremberg Chronicle. And why is it so important? Well, first of all, this is the first time that the printed word in an image appeared on paper, uh, in the same, on, the, on, on the same piece of paper. Uh, like you said, Jean-Pierre, it, it allowed for a type of communication that never happened before. Uh, this, what you see right now, is a woodblock engraving. Uh, it's, the, it's the city of Nuremberg. But in the Chronicle, there's over 1,800 wood engravings in this book. The undertaking of this uh, at the time was the greatest undertaking in, public, in, in, in publishing a book that the world had known up until this period of time. Um, it is also the height of the humanist period. Schadel, who was a physician in Nuremberg, uh, a very famous uh, humanist, uh, which came just before the Renaissance, uh, and, and the humanists believed that the way to heaven, and John Pierre, to your point, that the way to heaven was through a strong mind and a strong body. And the Chronicle was, was, was developed, was published, that everything that you needed to know in the world to educate yourself was in the Chronicle. And if you knew the, if you had the wisdom and the knowledge of the Chronicle, that was your entrance to heaven. So this whole age of discovery, this thirst for knowledge, people going around the world uh, in every different, in every different uh, form, in, in mathematics, astronomy, uh, in the arts, um, in, in astronomy, uh, looking at the heavens, traveling the world, uh, gathering this information, it became uh, this, this, this civic duty that you had as a human being uh, to go out in the world and, and educate yourself and to learn. That was the spark of the Renaissance. And the, and the, and the Nuremberg Chronicle is that link from the late Middle Ages to the start of the Renaissance. I can't emphasize too much how important the chronicle was to human development. And, and you may ask, well, what does that have to do with the story of America? Well, uh, the Nuremberg Chronicle and every map that you will see from this point on was made possible because of the printing press. The printing press basically blew open, opened up knowledge that was previously restricted to the elites, to the aristocracy, to people who could afford a tutor, or the clergy to everyone. I mean, the printing press was probably the most revolutionary technology ever developed. Forget computers, you know. But the printing press suddenly knowledge that had been bottled up in monasteries or castles or palaces was suddenly now available. Hundreds of thousands of publications were suddenly available 
uh, throughout Europe and, and the known world. Um, and that led us to the first map that's very important in our story uh, about the birth of America, which is the famous Waldsee Müller map, which, Neil, I, I believe is, is very, very rare, isn't it? Well, actually, there's only one of them. And, um, and this map is so rare that there's one. In fact, the story of this map is absolutely fascinating. It's how America got its name. It's why we're called Americans is because of the map that you see uh, here. Walter Mueller, who is a, a German cartographer, um, he got a copy, and this was published in 1507. The Chronicle, which I just showed you, was, uh, was 1493. So Columbus had left, but he hadn't yet returned. So the world was still flat when the Chronicle was, was published. But this map was 1507. Um, Americo Vespucci uh, sailed to the Americas in 1501 and 1502. And as part of his voyages, he determined that the New World was actually the New World. He coined the name the New World. Up until then, uh, Columbus had felt that he had landed in Asia, and that he was in Asia. He ne he did not know that this was an was a was new lands was was undiscovered uh, was an undiscovered uh, continent. Vespucci figured that out. He sailed down the coast of South America, um, and then you know he 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 went back uh, to Europe. He published all of his notes about his voyages. And uh, Walsey Mueller, who published this map, got a copy of the Vespucci letters, and he was totally fascinated about this new continent that uh, that Vespucci had talked about, and he included it on his world map for the very first time. And you see to the left the the Western Hemisphere. So the so the 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 known world, the Ptolemy world at the time. Uh, you could see on the right from Africa over to Asia. He basically took Ptolemy's work from the second century and he added this new continent for the very first time we see this new continent. And in recognition of Vespucci, he engraved over what is Brazil, America. That was the first time ever that the word America had shown up in cartography. And this map was talked about um, throughout throughout time in the, in the, in the 1500s and the 1600s, uh, but nobody had ever seen a copy of it. It was talked about, but no one had ever seen it. And in 1901, the map was discovered in a castle in Germany. And it took from then until 2006, the United States government negotiating with the government of Germany and the owners of the castle to have the map transferred to the United States where it now permanently resides at the Library of Congress. So there it is, the Waltzing Mueller map. That's why we are called Americans. There wasn't like a, a group of people sitting somewhere in Europe who voted on what should they name this new continent. It was a cartographer, an obscure uh, cartographer in Germany who happened to get these letters and was totally fascinated by the Vespucci letters. And in honor of him, he just engraved the word America over South America where, where Vespucci had sailed. And um, and then it stuck. It stuck. And that's the way a lot of things were named um, as they were being discovered. Just a, a cartographer had named it and then they were copied in plagiarism was rife. And then after a while, it just stuck. And that is why it is now the Americas. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in the interest of time and talk a little bit about, we're now going to talk about the, the discovery of America. Of course, you know the story of Columbus. Columbus sailed to Central America. He thought he had reached Asia. What he had done instead was discovered a new world. And in his wake came Spanish and Portuguese conquistadores, these uh, conquerors. And, and it should be said that um, as they did that, as they roamed through the Americas, um, the area of what we call now the southern part of America, Florida, New Mexico, Texas, but most of the Spanish conquest was focused on Latin America because that's where they hoped to find silver and gold. And in the process, they destroyed many of the indigenous cultures, not necessarily by the sword, but by the diseases that they imported from, from Europe. Having said that, uh, by sort of the beginning of the 17th century, the Spanish had now basically settled in Central and South America, but North America was still fairly open. And one of the first people to check it out and to establish a settlement 
uh, were the Dutch who found an island called Manahata. And Neil, uh, where does the story take us from there? Well, this is a beautiful uh, map um, uh, from 1651. It's a Vischer map. Uh, it was produced in Amsterdam. And this was at the time that the Dutch had, had established the, the, the settlement of New Amsterdam, which is today New York City in Lower Manhattan in 1625. So this map was produced in 1651. And the cartouche, the image that you see there, is the very first image of New York City. And, and to Jean-Pierre's point, maps was the way of communicating, was mass communication. It, it wasn't just for the map from a, a geography point of view, but it was from the imagery point of view. There was no photography, there were no images. So these maps also provided the very first glimpses of the new world. And in this particular case, you see the very first image of New York City. So New York City, basically at the time of New Amsterdam, extended from, from Battery Park to Trinity Church or up close to Wall Street. So as you can see, it's a very small area. So there it is, the very first image in New York City on a Dutch map when it was New Amsterdam, it was not yet New York City. So this map um, was really produced in Holland to get the Dutch to immigrate to the new world. And it shows all of these animals and, and all of these different uh, food sources, you know, showing, wow, this new world, it's, it's full of, it's full of uh, great bounty and you're going to be able to feed your family. And, you know, the Dutch knew if they were going to hold on to their, to their, to their settlements and um, which included new England, they call, they, they call it new uh, uh, Belgica. Uh, they would have to get the Dutch to immigrate. And so this map was really used for that purpose to get the Dutch to get interested in immigrating to the new world. And, and of course, while the map was mechanically reproduced on copper plate on the, on the paper press, each of these maps was then hand colored individually, which is an art in itself. So uh, Neil uh, owns most of the maps that you see here and that are in the book. Right. Claim your dreams, bring your families, make your life, um, the, the riches, you know, the things that this country can offer you, like there's no country in the world that can do that. So the whole American exploration and reaching out into the world and in that whole exuberance that came with settling the continent is because of this map. This map told the American people, we support you, go west claim your destiny, claim your dreams. The manifest destiny of the United States was coined by this map. And I think it's also important to, to remember that at the time when this map was crafted and the time when the United States was established, by far virtually all countries in the world were uh, autocratic uh, absolutist kingdoms, monarchies, you know, even Britain, uh, which was supposedly a constitutional monarchy, the, the king still ruled. I mean, George III clearly had a very strong control of what happened, what happened with the war, what happened with uh, military strategy, but also what was happening in the country. So the idea that you could build a country based on this Greek term called democracy, which comes from the word demos in Kratain, the people rule, literally, that's what it means, demos uh, the people rule, it was a crazy idea. I mean, a bunch of philosophers in the previous century had sort of been sitting around, you know, drinking lots of wine and talking about, well, wouldn't it be wonderful, you know, if the people could rule their nation and their destiny rather than a king? They became known as the uh, Enlightenment, the philosophers of the Enlightenment. But nobody had ever really seriously translated that into fact, I mean, Catherine of Russia, she flirted with the idea as it Frederick of Prussia did do, you know, all oh, very interesting. Oh, come, come over and tell us about these ideas. <laughs> Nobody in his, in his mind was really planning to put those ideals into practice. I mean, are you out of your mind? Give the people the power to rule themselves. And so the, that's why the establishment of the United States and of America was such a a unique moment in the history of humankind. And yes, there were issues, there was slavery that would take another century to be resolved, which is 
of course, a major stain on that history. But the idea that a country could be formed by basically giving the control of government to the governed uh, was such a radical idea that, that virtually every ruler in Europe and beyond was sort of wondering like they're out of their, they're out of their mind. And look, right now, democracy, though not yet fully established around the world, uh, it's in various parts of the world, it's under, under pressure, but it's still uh, a shining example uh, for people around the world. So, um, oh, okay, we, we, we uh, ended the, uh, the sharing here. And uh, I think at this point uh, is, a, is a great time to see if there are any questions. Jean-Pierre, were you done with the PowerPoint? Was that? Yes, we're done. Okay, all right, good. <laughs> I think that did it all on its own, but um, it's a good thing we were finished. So it does look like we have one question. Um, and just a reminder to everyone in the audience, if you would like to ask a question, you can do so by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. There should be a little one by it, and um, you can put your questions in there. Okay, so through your research, was there an interesting fact or an interesting map that did not make it into the book for whatever reason? Neil, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I think, I think that we've been very thorough. Now, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of maps. Um, the map of El Dorado, and I think right. is really a, a beautiful map, a very in interesting map. Of course, the city of gold, the mythical map of El Dorado, you know, I think was, was really great. But, you know, in, in cartography, there was really so much really wonderful work that was done. Um, uh, there was just so much uh, incredible work that was done. It was impossible to get everything. I mean, you know, we talk about, I, I think there's what, about 180 images in the book. I think, you know, I personally have about 1500 images and maps from American, the American collection. So just a little more than 10% is included. So it's hard to say, you know, that it, 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 no book can ever be absolutely comprehensive. But I really believe, you know, the what we've selected in the book is really the high points. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. I mean, there are so many beautiful artifacts, uh, particularly in the so-called golden era of cartography in the 17th century in, in Holland when you have so many renowned cartographers creating these beautiful maps, not only of America, but around the world, uh, that, that um, you know, that, that is something that you can write a book about, just about that golden era. And by the way, Neil and I are planning to uh, continue the series with a book about mapping Asia and mapping the Holy Land. So stay tuned for those, um, because that's when we will be able to share many other beautiful maps about other parts of the world. Okay, hey, looks like we got some good ones here. All right. Did the Portuguese and the Basque keep their maps of East North America secret prior to the arrival of Columbus? Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> unlike, um, unlike the British or the Dutch, um, the Portuguese considered their maps a state secret. Um, not so much because of the geographical discoveries they were making, but because the sea routes were at that time a strategic asset. I mean, don't forget, this is the time when Europe's population exploded and people needed spices to preserve their food and so feed a rapidly growing population, which ignited the so-called spice race. Now the spice race to the Indies uh, was not so much because people like to have pepper <laughs> on their meat, but because that was the only way to preserve food and to feed the multitude. So the refrigeration was still many centuries in the future. So the spice race and the routes that led to the East Indies and the Indies where these spices could be had were of tremendous political and economic importance. And so the Portuguese did not publish their charts as well as which contain the sea routes uh, or or the um, or or the the maps themselves, the Spanish later on did because the Spanish developed such a powerful fleet that nobody could really try to defeat them, even though the British tried. Okay, looks like 
Uh, this is from Jorge Gonzalez. First, let me congratulate you both and thank you for this book. Um, I look forward to spending some time enjoying it. Did you dedicate any portion of the book to the trade routes in Asia? Not, not specifically, though there was a very famous trade route from Manila to Mexico and uh, because of the gold trade. And, you know, the, they would take the gold from the Philippines, they would come across the Pacific, then they would transship it, you know, through the Caribbean back to Spain. Um, you know, that was a very important route uh, back during Spanish time. But uh, no, we, we really did. And then that's why there's Mapping Asia, stay tuned, uh, because, you know, I also have a, I started my collection in Asia, actually, I was living in Singapore at the time. And I first built this incredible collection on Asia. And then after 20 plus years, I came back to the United States. And I says, Oh, well, you know, I, and, and it, then I just got completely fascinated in the Americas. But we're going to tell the story of Asia. And uh, stay tuned to that. It's, it's, it's absolutely a fascinating story as well. That sounds great. We'll have to have you back for that. Yes, one. for sure. Hopefully in person. Um, okay, so we have one more question. And I love this one. So I save it for the end. Um, what was a historical element of map making or photography that you particularly love, but think unfortunately fell out of fashion, i.e. here there be dragons? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question again? Oh, yes. What is what? No. What was an element of map making or cartography that you particularly love, but eventually fell out of fashion? That's I. You know, e, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You know, to, to me, you know, when 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 you saw the Ptolemy map, the first map that we seen, that was a wood block engraving. So think about it. You took a piece of wood and you carved out these images in wood in relief, and the wood was very soft. That's why you have so few documents, like the Nuremberg Chronicle. When I showed you the Nuremberg Chronicle, that's all woodblock engraving, the late Middle Ages. Uh, the Ptolemy maps that we showed you, that's woodblock engraving, the late Middle Ages. So few of this um, exists today because it was just, well, so many years ago, but also the way they made it, only a few could be produced, relatively very few. And um, those woodblock engravings are coming from the late Middle Ages uh, they're so rare, they're so rare, but they're so fascinating to see. Well, first of all, it's world is flat, okay, so Columbus had not yet, it's pre-Columbus, and what they knew, and you know, in one time, one way, it's incredibly fascinating how much they knew, and Ptolemy, remember, he's the second century. Uh, he, he, he mapped the world that, that we knew up until the, the beginning of the Renaissance, the person responsible for cartography that everybody referred to actually lived in the in the in the second century so those old woodblock engravings pre-columbus to me is some of the most fascinating work uh to look to be holding uh to study and to, to have in and to be in the presence of you just feel like you're in the presence of something incredibly incredibly important no, I, I would I would agree, Neil. The, the fact today maps are made with com by computers. You know, we use satellite imagery and triangulation and GPS and all these other wonderful things. But the art of cartography, the art of creating a map and etching it into a copper plate, uh, is lost. I mean, in, in Japan and in China today, some artists still use wood blocks as they have been doing for for centuries. But unfortunately, it is an art that is largely lost, um, it, at least in terms of the cartography. So even though we have beautiful maps today, they're no longer the individual works of art that we knew from times past. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much, Jean-Pierre. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us tonight. I think it's a great conversation. You guys have some great questions. Oh, and, and Jean-Pierre, thank you so much for running that presentation. It was great to have those beautiful pictures accompany uh, all this great information. Terrific. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Of course. And if you guys haven't ordered your book yet, please do so by clicking the green button below. Um, every, every purchase supports Books and Books, and we really appreciate it. So thank you guys so much, and have a great night. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.